Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show, uh, the show that profiles the humans behind the really big ideas that have shaped the world and are inspiring uh, the future and creators of the future. I'm Ira Pastor, your health, aging, and longevity ambassador along for this ride. Uh, so for the last several shows, we've been spending a lot of time on the different hierarchical levels of uh, the biologic architecture of life, uh, disease and aging. Uh, we've spent time talking about the genome, the microbiome, tissue engineering. Uh, we've even dabbled a little bit in quantum biology and chronobiology. Um, today, though, we are going to take a step back from the, the more traditional sort of reductionist thinking uh, that we find in, in the biotech landscape uh, that existed for many decades, you know, sort of relies on proverbially pulling the pieces apart, and instead look at the bigger picture, uh, in essence, putting the pieces back together uh, with the acknowledgement that in biology, uh, the whole is in many ways usually much greater than just some of its parts. Uh, and these very important steps uh, fall to the domain of systems biology, uh, a field of study that looks specifically at the interactions between components of biologic systems and how these interactions give rise to function and behavior of systems and the respect to biologic processes, whether that's embryogenesis, morphogenesis, growth, development, aging, disease, degeneration. It's truly a cross-disciplinary field integrating many scientific disciplines, um, including biology, computer science, engineering, bioinformatics, just to name a few, uh, ultimately all working in synergy to predict how these systems change over time under different conditions, and ultimately how we develop solutions, and not just for health, but also potentially for agriculture, uh, the environment, ecology, and so forth. Uh, in the human health space, uh, systems biology's translational opportunities include, but are not limited to, a discovery of new biomarkers of disease, uh, stratifying patients based on pharmacogenomic and toxicogenomic differences, and of course the development of new drugs and interventions to take into account these different systems processes. So for today's guest, uh, I really could think of no one better to come talk to us for a while and truly honored that, that someone of his caliber has offered his time uh, than Dr. Leroy Hood, who is Chief Strategy Officer, Co-Founder, and Professor at the the Institute for Systems Biology, and Senior Vice President and Chief Science Officer at Providence St. Joseph Health. Uh, routinely listed as one of the top visionaries and innovators of all times in the biotech field, uh, Dr. Hood's work has had a resounding effect on the advancement of science since uh, the mid-20th century. Uh, starting with an MD from Johns Hopkins and a PhD at Caltech in biochemistry, Dr. Hood was involved in the development of six instruments that are really crucial for the existence of contemporary biotechnology as we know it today. Uh, namely, automated DNA sequencers, DNA synthesizers, protein sequencers, peptide synthesizers, uh, the inkjet printer for construction of DNA arrays, and large-scale synthesis of DNA, and the nanostring instrument for single molecule analysis of both RNA and DNA. These instruments literally opened the door to the era of high throughput biologic data and big data in biology and medicine. Uh, Dr. Hood also helped pioneer the Human Genome Project, making it possible with his automated DNA sequencer and with his peptide synthesizer was involved in the synthesis of HIV protease uh, with Stephen Kent and others leading to development of the first protease inhibitors. Uh, 1992, Dr. Hood created the first cross-disciplinary biology department, molecular biotechnology at the University of Washington. And in 2000, he founded the Institute for Systems Biology, which was really the first organization of its type committed to the systems approach to biology and disease, and has pioneered systems medicine and scientific wellness in recent years since ISP's founding. It's been a major proponent of a healthcare known as P4 medicine that is predictive, preventative, personalized, and participatory. Uh, in 2016, he oversaw the ISP's affiliation with Providence St. Joseph Health uh, with the goal of translating personalized medicine system biology into the clinic for every patient. Uh, and he's made you know, a numerous discoveries in the fields of immunology, neurobiology, cancer, biotech, uh, most recently been a leader in development systems biology, its application to cancer and neurodegenerative diseases, uh, and, and really personalized medicine, pioneering technologies on this new front. Uh, hundreds of papers, numerous patents responsible for uh, founding over 15 different biotech companies from Amgen, Applied Biosciences, Rosetta Informatics, Darwin, Integrated Diagnostics. Uh, and he is one of the only you know, 20 individuals that has ever been elected to three national academies, National Academy of Science, Academy of Engineering, and National Academy of Medicine. Uh, and most recently, his amazing life uh, was recently profiled in a book entitled Hood, The Trailblazer of the Genomic Age. Dr. Hood, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. 
it, it's, it's, real, it's really a great honor. Um, you know, typically we, we start off by giving our guests the floor uh, just to, obviously there's no one in my industry that doesn't know you, but for those outside of the industry, um, just to tell us a little bit more about you, sort of your background, where you grew up, and, and ultimately how you got interested on this path in terms of science, medicine, biochemistry that, that led you uh, to where you are today. Obviously, I don't mean for you to rehash your whole book, but just if you could uh, you know, take us a little bit down that path, that'd be awesome. Okay, I uh, grew up in a small town in Montana, went to a high school that had uh, 146 students, played on a football team, a quarterback that was undefeated for last three and a half years of my uh, stay there. Uh, I had four of the best teachers I ever had in my entire career. And, and one of them actually asked me to teach sophomore biology with him when I was a senior and I used Scientific American to do that. And, and one of the most interesting articles I read, this is 1956, okay. three years after the discovery of DNA, it was on the structure of DNA. Mm -hmm. And I decided biology was where I'd like to go if DNA was the central core molecule. Although I didn't understand much about it at the time. This same professor had actually gone to Caltech in the Navy during World War II to learn meteorology and he mm -hmm. decided if he ever had a good student, he would send him to Caltech. So he started talking my junior year about my going to Caltech, which frankly I had never heard of. But in the end, uh, I did. And I got a terrific undergraduate background in uh, biology, chemistry, physics. I had Feynman as my freshman physics teacher. Okay. I had Colin <laughs> actually lecturing to me in uh, in freshman chemistry, so it was it was really uh, a spectacular opportunity at Caltech. There, I really started getting interested in human biology, but Caltech had essentially no human biology. So I decided I'd go to medical school, mm -hmm. and it turned out Hopkins had an accelerated program where if you just wanted to go and do something unusual, you could finish in three years if you go in the summers and. I took that program and there got exposed really to all the things that I later became interested in, in science, uh, molecular immunology, uh, cancer, neurodegeneration, and, and things like that. But what I was really impressed with uh, as I, I uh, then went from medical school back to Caltech to get a PhD so I could learn how to do science, I, I became uh, increasingly impressed with uh, the enormous complexity of humans, and we'll return to that uh, a little bit later. Sure. At Caltech, my, my advisor actually gave me two superb pieces of advice. One, he said, if you're going to do biology, practice it always at the leading edge. It's more fun there. Mm -hmm. And he said, two, if you want to transform a field, invent new technologies that give you access to new kinds of data. And so those became core principles. I went briefly uh, to NIH uh, during the Vietnam War days. Mm -hmm. For three years, I was a senior investigator and I did molecular immunology. I learned how to run a lab and then back to Caltech for uh, 22 years uh, as a faculty member uh, in 1970. And it was, when I went back to Caltech, I realized here was an incredibly open slate. I could do whatever I wanted to do in the future. So what did I want to do? And of course, I did two things I was really interested in, molecular immunology. Mm -hmm. And that gave me deep insights into the incredible complexity of human biology and technology development. Uh, and uh, later emerged the vision of this family of instruments that could, when integrated together, uh, mm -hmm. accomplish really incredible kinds of feats. But underlying all of that was this, this real interest, this love in human biology and the conviction that, you know, it, it's kind of like the fable of the elephant and the sixth lineman. Mm -hmm. uh, 
each felt a different part of the elephant and declared the elephant was a, uh, a, a spear or a fan or a trunk, when in fact, it was a little bit of all of those things. Sure. But in fact, there weren't many measurements, so you couldn't really tell much about the elephant. And that was true, really, of medicine. You'd go into a physician, you'd sit down, he'd make some general observations, he'd send you out for clinical chemistries, perhaps 10 or 20, but they didn't even begin to touch the enormous complexity of the human being. So I became fascinated with, could we begin to think about technologies that could speed up gathering uh, data from human beings? And that led into uh, the six instruments that you uh, actually talked about. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you, as you pointed out what that did, was set me up to be invited to the first meeting ever held on the Human Genome Project in mm -hmm. the spring of 1985 at Santa Cruz. Twelve of us went to pass judgment on, on the Genome Project. And, mm -hmm. and, and we came to two interesting conclusions. One, that it was technically feasible, although at that time really difficult. But two, what was surprising to me is we were split six to six on whether it was a good idea mm. and the six against it were really against it and it was really had to do with big science and big science would destroy the classic small science of uh, typical biology and all and and indeed when i went on out into the community and started uh, advocating for the genome project i'd say initially 80 percent of the biologists really opposed it i had some enormously interesting kind of depressing early experiences about <laughs> the, the passion against uh, in the Human Genome Project. But uh, what was interesting is the institution most against it was the National Institutes of Health. <laughs> it argued that they were doing genetics and genetics was the same as genomics and there was no need for this big expensive project. And of course, they came around in the end and played a uh, a central role, as we all know. But, but as you said, I think what the Genome Project did that was utterly transformational is one, they gave us access to any piece of DNA in the genome, including uh, all the genes, sure. and that was important for biology and understanding what genes did and all that. But equally important, they defined the human polymorphisms, the genetic mm. variability, and they gave us the tools to begin correlating that variability with either wellness phenotypes or disease phenotypes. So, so the Genome Project uh, at the beginning of the 21st century was really uh, a transformational epic uh, addition to how we can think about medicine in the future. From the Genome Project, I got excited uh, once again about cross-disciplinary biology because to put together the automated sequencer, we had to bring, we had to marry chemistry with engineering, computer sure. science, and molecular biology. And, and again, uh, Dreyer's dictum of be at the leading edge, but wouldn't it be great if the leading edge operated in a cross-disciplinary environment where any technology that you really needed, you could go and get done and have as well the analytic tools to be able to analyze the information. And uh, I suggested starting such a department in the late 80s at Caltech. Uh, and the biologists and chemists uh, were excited about it. Physicists, I think, were indifferent. The biologists categorically vetoed it. Mm. So Bill Gates made it possible to go to the University of Washington set up the first department. And you know, that department was really spectacular. Phil Green developed the two key software pieces that drove the Human Genome Project. Rudy Ebersol and, and John Yates developed the first two critical techniques for the newly emerging field of proteomics. Mm -hmm. uh, Ger van den Ing invented a multi-parameter high-speed cell sorter, different principles than before. We developed the inkjet technology that lets you do rapid DNA synthesis there and so forth. But what I'd really wanted to do is build uh, a systems biology department on top of that. And 
it was clear that at a big bureaucratic university, that was going to be an enormous challenge. So in 2000, I did resign and start the Institute for Systems Biology. And I think the unique feature that it retains today is it has a small decision line, a very small leadership hierarchy, right. and it can make decisions rapidly and, and move ahead uh, at a rapid pace and everything. And that, that made it possible to do many things over the past 20 years that opened the doors to uh, different aspects of, of biology and so forth. One of the most interesting opportunities occurred when I met in 2007, the Minister of Economy for the state of Luxembourg. Okay. And he was the most powerful politician there by far at that time. And he decided that he wanted to transform the economy from a 90% dependence on financial services to bring in healthcare and biotech. So after we would talked for an hour or so, he said, well, why don't you put in a proposal to help us do this? And I remember asking him, what were the financial constraints? And he said, none. <laughs> I like that. So, so what we did was we proposed to set up an institute in our own image at the newly minted University of Luxembourg. I think at that time it was four years old. Uh, and that was called uh, the Center for Systems Biomedicine. Okay. And we recruited the director, we helped recruit faculty, we took 11 postdocs, trained them in our technologies and computational tools, and they returned for one to five years to transfer that kind of knowledge. And we set up a network both in Europe and US to have collaborative interactions with this newly emerging entity, and it was successful within uh, three or four years because of uh, knowing the strategy you needed to build a second time, uh, a systems biology department, everything. Mm -hmm. What they did give us was 100 million over a period of five years wow. to develop the technologies and strategies of systems medicine. And that was really uh, a turning point for us because it opened up all sorts of new possibilities including in 2014, revisiting my old idea of saying, gee, let's really get a lot of data on humans mm -hmm. and see if we can figure out what wellness is and predict early disease. Mm -hmm. So in 2014, uh, uh, together with Nathan Price, a colleague at ISB, we uh, started, the, uh, we persuaded 108 of my friends to undergo what we call deep phenotyping. Mm -hmm. So complete genome sequence analysis every three months, an analysis of 1,200 analytes, proteins, clinical chemistries, uh, and metabolites. Every three months, we measured the gut microbiome, and then we used the Fitbit and other devices to make quantized measurements. And what we showed is that one, each individual had utterly unique data clouds mm -hmm. that when analyzed led to unique combinations of actionable possibilities, which if acted upon could either improve health and or avoid uh, disease. And this project ran for a period of nine months. I think it demonstrated beautifully the improved health. But what it also demonstrated in a really spectacular way was the power of these longitudinal data clouds mm -hmm. to give fundamental new insights into biology uh, and into medicine. <laughs> so many of the individuals were really enthusiastic about this program. We started a company called Aerofail in <laughs> mid-2015 that brought this, uh, this entity, which we then had named scientific or quantitative wellness, uh, to individual consumers. And over a period of about four years, it gathered 6,000 clients, each of which had these longitudinal data clouds. Mm -hmm. And again, they had the same success in 
validating uh, the improvement and wellness in very striking ways. But the data clouds actually, again, uh, extending it by 15 fold were uh, uh, an order of magnitude more informative about mm -hmm. new kinds of biology and, and, and understanding of disease. So this placed us in uh, 2016 in a unique position. We defined scientific wellness and the CEO of Providence St. Joseph's Health the world's, the U.S.'s third largest nonprofit health company, uh, 51 hospitals, uh, seeing 5 million patients a year, uh, uh, 30 million electronic medical records. It was an ideal, it was an ideal system into introduced into which to introduce the concepts that had emerged from systems thinking about disease, namely systems medicine and P4 healthcare, sure. that is healthcare, as you said, predictive, preventive, personalized and participatory uh, into a big healthcare system. He asked me to become the chief science officer and for ISB to affiliate with Providence to, be, uh, to aid in the research efforts. And we did this and it opened up a whole new era of really being able to bring what I call 21st century medicine right to the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. and, and 21st century medicine is about systems medicine, it's about P4 healthcare, mm -hmm. it's about scientific wellness, and it's about using dense phenotyping in well patients as well as disease patients to deal more effectively to achieve more effectively uh, their health and so forth. So it's, it's been an outstanding success. So that's kind of bringing my history up to date and we can talk about any of the areas that you'd like to get into in detail. A absolutely, and I love it. Was, it was a wonderful overview. I, I'd love to get into them all. Um, I'd, like, I'd like to start off though with um, sort of the, the part of that path where you, you in essence, I thought make it the transition from sort of, on one side you've developed for a few decades these extremely important tools that have built the biopharma you know, giants as we know them today. And then on the other hand, you're now explaining, hey, there's this great piece in the book where you know, you're explaining this thing to all people, Bill Gates, as you mentioned, who just wasn't really getting it that, hey, there's now this new dimension of stuff we need to do in 2000 and such, uh, where we go beyond that to systems thinking. Um, you know, I, I hung out the last 35 years or so in the traditional drug industry, completely reductionist in its thinking, very difficult to interact with <laughs> when you bring these topics up. What are some of the, the challenges, the surprises that you've bumped into, whether it's with your colleagues, business partners, investors, as you've said, it's basically brought this thing to the table. It says, hey, we've done a lot of great stuff with this one approach now, this more reduction stuff. Now we have to go the systems way. Um, what are some of the things you've run into? Any interesting stories in regard to that? Because obviously you've been very successful in, in getting the partners, getting the investors and so forth. But I'm sure there's a lot of people along the path that are like, I don't get, I don't get what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it started really in, I would say the late 1990s when I'd really started thinking about systems biology and trying to get it installed. Uh, at the University of Washington. Mm -hmm. I remember one of my National Academy of Science friends from MIT saying, I think about 98 or 99, you know, this systems biology is utter hype. There's nothing to it. It's utterly going to be trivial. You're not going to amount to anything. Why are you wasting your time with something that you can never use to good end in understanding science? So, and, and, you know, he was non-trivial. But what it points out is how conservative mm -hmm. scientists are, basically. I mean, we're, most of us are really married to what we learned early or our experiences as they evolved across our career. And, and we're 
very cynical about new ideas. And look, with any new idea, it's really easy to think of hundreds of things that it fails to explain or that it doesn't do or that it, it points that it misses. But in fact, you have to see through all of that forest of objections to the real opportunities that exist. Now, I remember when I wanted to move to the University of Washington in 1992, talking with the dean about um, systems biology and cross-disciplinary biology. And at the end of my first interview with the dean, he said, uh, and this dean was a good scientist and really a good dean in many ways. So I have a lot of respect for him. But what he said at the end of that, that first interview is he said, Lee, this stuff is just too fancy for a medical school. It, it just wouldn't fit in here. I can't in all uh, sincerity argue that, that uh, we should bring you here and you should do cross-disciplinary biology and systems biology. But what was really interesting about this individual is about four days later, he called me up and he said, I was totally wrong. I've really thought this through. <laughs> I've talked to some people. He said, I'd like to fly down and spend a whole day with you and convince you that I've really changed my mind and that Washington would be a good place for you to come. So that was a, that was a really interesting experience where an individual could actually make uh, a real-time kind of adjustment to uh, to a big paradigm change and systems biology was in fact a big paradigm change. Mm -hmm. I would say, as you know, there are probably several hundred systems biology departments or institutes or centers or things like that uh, across the world and all. It's a it's it's a pretty common byword, but. I would, I would say most of those still don't begin to understand the multiple dimensions of systems biology. In some cases, it's computational and orientation. Mm -hmm. And in the end, systems biology is really biology. Right. That is, you need to use all the computational methods to machine learning to make statistical analyses of things, but statistics aren't biology. They're only the, the way that you create hypotheses, which sure. have to be tested by perturbations to see if those hypotheses are indeed true. Mm -hmm. so I like this, this idea of big data uh, giving birth to uh, statistical analyses giving birth to interesting hypotheses followed by perturbations, which lets you understand the reality of mm -hmm. what this whole thing is. And I, I think for, uh, you know, a lot of the big IT companies have failed repeatedly in medicine. And I think the essence of it, they don't understand how important domain expertise is because in the end, these things are about biology and medicine they aren't about statistics and machine learning and uh, visualization and things like that. You have to go, those are powerful tools, but you have to go beyond them. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. You know, speaking of sort of the cross-disciplinary components of it all, you know, one of the concepts that uh, your organization uh, at ISB has, uh, you know, enlightened me over the years as I've read many papers so for this is this concept of of an attractor sort of this this mathematical concept of you know in, in dynamic systems that you know pushes a system in one direction or another and then when obviously when it comes to biology a biologic attractor sort of this uh, state, uh, whether it's cell, it's issue, an organ that evolves and emerges and stabilizes based on these, these ongoing interactions that are occurring all throughout our different biologic systems. Um, Sui Wang uh, at ISB, you know, writes a lot about this theme in, in, in regard to cancer and oncogenesis uh, and, and sort of these concepts of how uh, these perturbations, whether mutations or epigenetic modifications, things of this nature, we've a long time thought of them as, you know, causative of stuff, but if you, if you think in the grander systems perspective, 
of them being permissive, uh, this concept of cells exploring new states and new microenvironments. Um, all of that being said, you know, when you have that concept of, of what's going on as opposed to sort of the neat little sort of biology textbook uh, way of looking at things from the past, what are some of the thoughts on how, you know, moving forward, therapeutics are going to look different because, you know, it's not just going to be, you know, it's that sort of that little white pill anymore that is going to be able to nudge that uh, attractor state or that network, uh, but it may be combinations of, of interventions uh, that, that have to be uh, imposed to whether it's cancer or some other disease, move the attractor from disease to normal, or I know I'm simplifying this a little bit, yeah, but I'd yeah. love to hear your thoughts on sort of the, uh, what the future of the actual intervention may look like in some of these cases where you have a system. Sure. To work. sure. So I would say one of the utterly essential tools for understanding uh, dynamical systems theory of the type you described there is single cell analysis. And I'll give you an example of a single cell analysis we did on, uh, on uh, iPS cells mm -hmm. and following their differentiation to cardiomyocytes. Sure. And what we did was to interrogate this differentiation process at the single cell level, looking at hundreds of cells all the way along this transition. And then we mapped the transcriptional networks into this landscape which lets you see clearly the alternative paths that an iPS cell could take in going down through this differentiation process. There was one really major bifurcation that occurred uh, a few days into this process where the cell actually made a decision I'm going to become an endothelial cell, or I'm going to become a myo my myocardiocyte. Mm -hmm. And obviously, that was a little, you, you had to make a decision which ridge, which direction to go over a particular ridge to make those two choices. And what we were able to do is figure out perturbations which could drive that cell, mostly into the endothelial pathway or mostly into the cardiomyocyte pathway and to do it beautifully. So this is kind of the power of that kind of thinking. And for me, what it does is it takes an enormous amount of complex biology and it gives you really simple approaches mm -hmm. for helping the cell make decisions that are useful to medicine. That is, we want myocardiocytes or uh, endoderm cells or whatever it is. So, that, so I think as we learn more and more about this, we'll be able to manipulate those choices and drive the cells in pathways that will really be useful for, you know, a cellular therapy that is going to ever increasingly in the future emerge and be useful in medicine. Thanks. So I, I think... And, and I think what this does in a beautiful way is it lets you mask enormous complexity into simple choices and decisions that give you major alternatives kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's, so, so I think it's, an, a, I think in systems biology, understanding this, this, this dynamical systems thinking is really a key part to being able to define in very fundamental ways the nature of the biology and how we can manipulate it to, uh, to either understand biology or to humankind's welfare. Excellent. I'd like to, to touch on something now that I mentioned a little bit at the introduction, and that has to do with sort of the exceptional amount of technology transfer and sort of tech transfer related uh, biotech startups that you've been responsible for spawning and you know, throughout your career. Um, the, you know, I think many of the public are sort of unaware, you know, they think of biotech and they think that you know, funding is coming from some nondescript organization, government organization somewhere with a fancy acronym or whatever. Uh, but in reality, you know, there's this complex cycle of science, technology, commercialization, ultimately generating wealth to 
pump back in hopefully for more science and, and, and technology. Can you just talk a little bit about the importance of tech transfer and, and sort of the, the range of companies that you've built over the years uh, that have come off your technologies in, in, your, in, the, in the path? I mean, it, what, is tech transfer something that you were interested in doing, not interested in doing, you had to do it because it you know, created more projects? Uh, just tell us a little bit more about that because I, I think that's a sure. fascinating component sure. of the journey. Let me start at the beginning. I remember going to the president of Caltech in about 1978 and saying, look, I was developing a whole set of instruments and it was really clear to me that uh, I had an obligation to transfer those to society. Mm -hmm. And the most effective way of doing that was uh, a startup company that would, would build and uh, mature these instruments. And uh, the president, uh, a traditional physicist, Murph Goldberg, said, the role of an academic institution is education and scholarship. <laughs> it's not commercialization. And I said, I absolutely disagreed with you fundamentally. I said, one of the most fundamental obligations a scientist has is to transfer his useful knowledge to society in the most effective ways he can. And I think this is really important, these things get transferred. So he said, okay, you're on your own. Caltech is not interested in technology transfer. You go, you go out and do it yourself. So I said, okay, I would. So for the next year, I went to uh, 19 different instrument companies and technology companies and quasi-instrument companies and pitched these instruments. And, and you know, the vision really was compelling, I thought. But I was oh from 19 at the end. I will say DuPont considered it seriously, but in the end, they chose a clinical analyzer rather than a suite of instruments that I had. Okay. And so it was really depressing to come back at the end of that time. And I, I put a lot of time and effort I'd gone to Beckman Instruments three different times because Arnold Beckman was uh, chair of our board. I thought they surely would be interested. And the third time, they, the, the general manager there said to me, look, Lee, I understand what you're selling. I just want to tell you clearly we're not interested. Don't bother coming back. <laughs> so I said, okay, okay, I get the message. But then Bill Bowes, uh, a venture capitalist in San Francisco called me at, at the end of that year and he said, I hear you've been unsuccessfully shopping these things around. And uh, I said, yeah. And he said, well, why don't we, I'll, I'll give you uh, a few million and we'll start a, a company together to do this. I said, that's terrific. So I went back to the same president and said, look, I found funding for this. It's venture capital. And, you know, this was about the time Harvard and Tom Mattiatis and Mark Potashny were having all their trouble with, uh, with a company there. And uh, Murph Goldberger said to me, venture capital was dirty money. Caltech will never accept dirty <laughs> money. And I said, look, this just doesn't make sense. And, and the irony was, after about three months of pounding on him, he finally could have conceded and said, okay, uh, I'll, I'll give you permission to go ahead and do this and let's get started. But what happened ironically is we had a board meeting and I actually gave a talk to the board on the vision of the four instruments that we were developing, at, had developed or were developing at Caltech. Arnold Beckman came and immediately after this talk, he came running up to me and he said, this is fantastic. This is exactly what Beckman Instruments needs. And I said, gee, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I'd been there. I didn't think they were very interested at all. He said, that is impossible. He said, I'll fly out tomorrow and we'll get it all straightened out. So he flew up and what they ended up saying to him is, Lee misled us on these instruments, which wasn't true at all because he wanted to start a company and make a lot of money for himself. So Arnold came back really furious over this. And I'd written a history up of this whole thing for 
Murph Goldberger, I said, give him this history and he can see exactly what happened. And Murph wouldn't do that. And this set a lot of tension that went on for a couple of years with uh, Arnold Beckman and everything. But in the end, uh, we did have Bill Bowes and uh, others fund uh, applied biosystems. And it, you know, for its period of time, became the most set successful instrument company in the world. And it was in the black within the first nine months because mm -hmm. the first instrument that we developed, uh, the automated DNA sequencer, thanks to Mike Hunkabiller, was so well engineered that they had to do relatively small modifications. And the other instruments took uh, obviously longer to develop, but they succeeded in uh, producing all of them. And that got me started then on a career of uh, thinking about transferring knowledge to, to uh, 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 society through startup companies. Second company I got involved with was Amgen. And uh, <laughs> those first two companies were enormously positively reinforcing because they were, in fact, the uh, most successful companies in, in my career. Mm -hmm. But I, I would say one of the really critical things for academic centers about creating companies is they do two important things. One, they mature the technology in a way academics can never afford to do. Sure. For example, the estimate on the first kind of DNA sequencer was, you know, conceptually it cost about three or four hundred thousand dollars to put together all the ideas. And then I would say it cost uh, a million or so to put together the parts and have a prototype. But to get a robust instrument for sequencing, which Applied Biosystems did, was, was probably a 75, 90 million dollar operation. And to uh, automate it so that you can increase the throughput enormously was, uh, cost hundreds of millions, and that was the instrument that the first human genome was actually sequenced with and everything. So one thing, you can mature your technology, and that's really important. But the second thing that's really important is if you do it well, money from those companies comes back to your institute. So sure. I would say uh, ISB has probably benefited to the tune of 10 million plus for money coming back from various uh, aspects of these companies and things like that. So uh, it's, it's done very well. But I, th I think the most fundamental point is, look, society pays for us to do something we really love to do. Mm -hmm. Our obligation is if we discover things useful for society, it's our obligation to get them out there. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I'm going to move now into you know, one other sort of clinical topic, and, and that has to do with aging. Um, the uh, sort of the area of longevity biotechnology uh, is one that in the last couple of years has uh, you know, gotten kind of hot in terms of investment. Um, it is an area that you know, I, I would contend could use a dose or two of systems biology. You know, everybody has their theories about aging, they don't want to give up on, whether it's epigenetic modifications, telomeres, or stem cell exhaustion, or DNA damage, or whatever. Um, obviously, aging is extremely complex, a network series of processes that's going to you know, take a little more than, as I referred to, that little that little white pill. Um, you know, you've made a lot of progress on the scientific wellness front, uh, the, the Pioneer 100 Wellness Project, uh, obviously the P4 ideas. Uh, where do you see sort of an area like uh, this going? Because, you know, you have the experience in, in, with the Aravel experience, uh, technology, some customers, um, a process. Um, whether the world is ready for everything at this point, I'm not sure. But what, what is your vision in terms of aging specifically? Because this is a, you know, something that's you know, it's debated whether aging uh, it should be classified as a disease at the FDA and all this stuff. Um, take us a little bit into the future on that one, if you will. Um, as well, I think the most important thing one has to do for aging 
is get a really reliable metric for aging. And I think that will take a systems approach. And I will say, we've now just written and we're submitting after review a paper on aging. And I'll give you the general features of what it can do. I can't go into uh, all the details. But let me say, what we did was we took the 6,000 individuals from Aravale that ranged in age from 21 to 90 plus and bend them in 10 year categories, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50, and so forth. And then we looked at each of those categories as, as they aged at specific parameters that had to do with the regulation of expression of the 1,200 blood analytes that we measured. Mm -hmm. And from this kind of analysis came a metric which we call biological age. Okay. So your biological age is the age your body says you are, mm -hmm. as opposed to the age your birthday says you are. Sure. And obviously, if you're lower in biological age than your chronologic age, then you're in good shape. And if you're older, you're in bad shape. So what we did was to look at the 300 individuals in the Aravel population that had diabetes and showed on average their biological age was six years older than their chronologic age. We looked at about 250 with cardiovascular complications. Their biological age was two or three years older than their chronologic age. And, and we looked at the upper 5% of the individuals in Fitbit activity and showed they were three years younger than their biological age. Okay. So I'll just tell you, my biological age is 15 years younger than my chronologic age. Excellent. And I'm kind of a fanatic for exercise and keeping in good health and all of those kind of things. That's good to hear. But what was most telling about this is if you looked at people that came into Aravale that were five years or older than their chronologic age, for every year they stayed in Aravel, their biologic age came down a year. So my point is the way I think you can use your biological age and you can do N of one experiments on yourself to see what you can do to optimize your biological age. That is to move it down or at least to maintain it uh, in a steady state. And in fact, what I'm going to advocate in the future as we, we make this a little bit more mature is that every physical checkup, you should get your biological age determined. Okay. And what that does is it averages over the preceding year, your average health. Mm -hmm. So if your age goes up, you haven't done well. If your age goes down, you're doing well. So... So my own feeling about theories of aging and so forth, uh, I, I think there's a lot of noise. I think there are a lot of interesting experiments out there. Uh, and I think, but now we have a metric where we can really begin to assess in a way we weren't able to assess before what it means to age in a healthy fashion. And I would argue if you're really interested in moving into your 90s, um, physically alert, mentally healthy, and everything like that, that you should, in fact, use this biological age as a metric to continuously assess whether you're optimizing your aging. So it doesn't give you an answer to your uh, very specific question. But the, the first step in getting an answer to a question like that is having a metric that will let you assess Absolutely. the abilities. Yeah, I, I think that's an extremely important point that, you know, unless you can follow it uh, via 
tools as such that you're developing yeah. in the dark. And I mean, it's one thing to say mice live 50% longer or 100% longer, but what we want to do is say, as an individual is aging, what's happening? Wonderful. Wonderful. So I'm uh, getting into the part of the the show where I do my wrap-up question, and normally there's two points. Uh, I typically ask somebody about some scientific figure that they would like to meet. A lot of people say Lee Hood. <laughs> so uh, I won't give you that question, but I'm going to give you the question about uh, if Leroy Hood had the ability to meet somebody <laughs> that he wanted to meet that doesn't or isn't around anymore, I uh, think my my hypothetical time machine here, scientist, artist, uh, philosopher, whomever, uh, who would that have been for you? Leonardo da Vinci. We get da Vinci a lot on the show, but I'm glad to say that. Go ahead, take that one. Uh, I mean, you know, I've read uh, a biography of his recently, and he is an individual that was more unbounded in his thinking than almost anyone I know. And it would have been fascinating to talk to him about, uh, about art, about science, about the future, about... Uh, um, and, and, you know, I was uh, 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 recently saw a lot of uh, David, his classic work, and it is, was absolutely magnificent piece. But what was even more magnificent in that same art museum were four different pieces where emerging out of solid stone, he'd carved figures that were at various degrees of being finished. And, and I mean, that, that was one of the most moving artistic experiences I've had in ages and ages. This was in Florence and Italy, obviously. So it, it, I think he's one of the most interesting figures in all of history. I, I, I completely agree with you. I, I, I'm giggling. I have, a, I, have a, I don't know if it's the same book, but I have a book over here called Learning from Leonardo. And if it's, and especially it talks about embryology and things of this nature. It's just. It's, you know, it's mind boggling. 500 yeah. years ahead of the time. It's, it's, it's yeah. gnarly. Um, Dr. Hood, it, it's, it's been such a, an honor to have you join us today. A real pleasure talking to you. Um, uh, it, thank you for everything you're doing, uh, everything you've done, and clearly with the plans that you have uh, moving forward, uh, furthering sort of, as you refer to it, the clinical face of medicine, the clinical face of wellness, um, and, and really wishing you the, the, the best next uh, 50 years <laughs> in, in, in forming and, and creating this industry. Uh, it, it's, it's really been a great pleasure. It's been my pleasure. Uh, I've enjoyed the discussion. And uh, well, maybe some way, sometime, we'll get to meet Leonardo da Vinci together. If I can build that time machine, I'll. Uh, we'll do it. I'll, I'll put you on the patent and we'll, and we'll go get investors <laughs> for it to get. Okay. Play at the road show with you. Okay. Cheers. Thanks very much. Big pleasure. Thanks so much for the time. Right.